Hey guys, today's lesson is on angle bisectors. I want to give you a little glimpse at what angle bisectors can offer us. Uh, if you're playing soccer, here's the goalie right here. Um, and here's the guy going to kick the ball. Um, if this goalie stands exactly in the center of the goal right here, then he's equidistant from R and L. This angle bisector shows that. So positioning himself... Um, he has an equal likely chance to get the ball if he's really in the center, which is kind of a dumb moment. Um, honestly, if he was to move forward, he would actually cut off the angle by which the, uh, the soccer guy can actually score the shot. It's kind of an interesting idea. Um, this is a block of wood. Sometimes when you're building stuff, you have extra scraps of whatever around. And in order, if you were trying to get a round cut of, for maybe like a wheel or something out of it, um, using the in-center which we're going to learn is the intersection of the angle bisectors, would actually be able to maximize the size of the wheel that you're going to be able to cut out of this you know, scrap piece of wood. I don't know much about sprinklers. Um, I always think it's kind of interesting when you see a whole field that's you know, completely green, the same color as green, when you know that you know, sprinklers are being used. This is sort of a cross-hatching pattern of how sprinklers work and where they overlap and things like this. Um, I know down here is kind of the correct sprinkler placement you really don't want it up against a house um, otherwise it can destroy the foundation and you get leaks in the basement etc but basically the sprinkler placement uh, especially if they're round sprinklers or uh, circular sprinklers kind of an interesting concept um, which would deal with you know if this is our, our circle that we're using for our circular sprinkler how to actually maximize the area of the circle within without overlapping too heavily Kind of some interesting concepts, um, good life applications on how um, some of these angle bisectors might be applicable to real life, and hopefully that's something that you're able to do. This is kind of a fun challenge for me. We're looking at angle bisectors of a triangle, and we're going to be able to use those to find basically distances within uh, either triangles or other types of shapes. Um, remember that angle bisector is a ray that divides an angle into two congruent adjacent angles. Um, remember also that the distance from a point to a line is a length that is perpendicular to the, from the segment, uh, the point to the line. So this distance from S to R is actually the perpendicular distance, which is the so shortest distance. If we were to draw from S out here to, to this line out this way, it would actually be a longer distance than it would be if we use the perpendicular distance. Or if we use, drew some line this way, it would actually be longer than the perpendicular distance. So PS, this ray, is the bisector of this angle. The distance from S uh, to PQ and from is SQ, and these two are going to be perpendicular. This is actually me. Um, as a little kid, I was on my grandpa's couch here. This is kind of an old, old couch. I was about uh, either six or eight years old, and I, it was my birthday, and I received this book on dinosaurs. I was really fascinated by them. Um, this is me in my pajamas. I, I don't really know. It's pretty pretty geeky looking, I guess, but... That's where I'm at. Really like kids' books. I've been reading a lot lately, and I think they're pretty interesting. So we'll take a look at some of my favorites. Two theorems for us today. The angle bisectors theorem basically says that if you start off with AD, this is the ray, and it bisects this angle, and you know that DB is perpendicular to AB and these things. So basically, if you know that this is bisects it by the angle, and that you see that these are perpendicular to these to the big angle, then basically you're going to be able to conclude that these, wow, that's kind of fun, that these rays are going to be, these segments are going to be congruent. The converse to this says basically, hey, if you still have these being perpendicular, these two pieces are perpendicular, and you know this, then you can conclude that this thing is a bisector. So basically what we start off with is we start off with these two being congruent, and the 90 degree angles here perpendicular, and then we can conclude in the end that these two are congruent, or this is an angle bisector. So kind of interesting. Again, distance is the shortest length between two objects. Um, kind of a good way to, to think about that. We'll take a look at these really quickly. Um, in this drawing, notice that these it's an angle bisector. It means that BD is a ray that bisects this larger angle. We know these two pieces are uh, 90 degrees, they're perpendicular, so I can easily say that uh, AD is going to be 19 in length. Um, over here, if this is 28, this guy right here is also going to be 28, so I'll say the measure of angle EFH equals 28 degrees. Um, over here, it's actually asking for the measure of angle JKL. Uh, well, I know that LKM is 43 degrees, 
and I know that this angle is also going to be 43 degrees. So if I add those together, I'll get a total of 86 degrees because I'm looking for J to K to L, this entire angle here, 86 degrees. One of the first books that I actually remember reading or memorizing, I guess, was Brown Bear, Brown Bear, What Do You See? One of my favorite books growing up. Um, can you conclude that BD bisects angle ABC? Um, explain your answers. Um, this first one, we know that this is perpendicular and this is perpendicular. We don't know that they're the same length. If we knew that they were the same length, we could say yes. Until we know that they're the same length, we have to say no for this one. Similarly over here, we know that these are the same length, but we don't know that these are perpendicular. If we did, we could say yes. <laughs> since, since we can't, we have to say no. And over here, look, we have these are the same length and they're perpendicular, so in this case, we can say yes. Pretty similar set of questions here. Can you find the value of x? Explain why or why not. Um, over here, these are congruent. These are perpendicular. In this case, yeah, x just equals 9. Piece of cake. Um, over here, these are congruent, but we don't know that they're right angles. If we did, we'd be able to say yes, and we'd be able to solve for it. In this case, we do have a 90-degree angle right here. Unfortunately, what we really need is we need some sort of 90-degree angle. This, these two pieces need to be perpendicular like so. So unless we had this stuff going on, we really wouldn't be able to conclude what x is. They actually made the wrong part perpendicular. Kind of interesting how they did that. Next it says find the value of x. Um, this is just assuming that these two are going to be congruent here. So we say 5x minus 2 equals 4x plus 5. I'm sure we could solve for x without too much trouble. We'd get x equals 7. Um, when we solve this, this would be uh, x over here equals 7. Uh, something it could ask us to do is then take and substitute that back up here. Um, in this case, 5 times 7 is 35 minus 2 is 33 degrees. Just to check it, uh, 7 times 4 is 28 plus 5 would also be 33 degrees. That would be one way to do this. Um, additionally, we could do this with segments here. In this case, we would just say 4x plus 3 equals 8x minus 9. We're really good at solving these. I'm just going to tell you that x equals 3. Um, in this case over here, again, we're dealing with segments. So these segments, x would equal 8. You can take the time and actually do those if you want. Another thing that we're looking at is the consecutive... Uh, con uh, I'm sorry, concurrency of angle bisectors. Um, here's the idea that if we have angle bisectors like this part is, is an angle bisector, this part's an angle bisector, maybe I should make these two arcs, and this piece right here is an angle bisector, something like this, then they will all intersect at one point called the in center, and then that makes this piece, this piece, and this piece all congruent. The reason it's called an in-center, if you look down below, is you can actually draw a circle with the in-center being the center of the circle. It looks a lot like this. Um, what happens then is those pieces that we had drawn that are perpendicular, not necessarily um, directly like in line with, well, it should have gone right there, but not directly necessarily in line with what we had drawn, um, but perpendicular to each of these places, something like this. Each of these is going to then form a radius, a radius as we go along, all of the same length. And that length, that distance from the center to the side, is what we really talk about when we talk about this being equidistant. So it says the point of concurrency, three angle bisectors of a triangle is called the in-center. The in-center always lies inside the triangle. That's pretty interesting to know. We'll have to encounter that soon. Because the in-center P is equidistant from the three sides of the triangle, a circle drawn using P as the center and the distance to one side as the radius um, will just touch the other two sides. So if we start here and we draw that circle, it's going to just touch at three points. Um, it then says the circle is said to be inscribed. So the circle is inscribed. If you want a name for the circle, it's actually called the in-circle. And that's why we, where we also get the name for the center called the in-center. So basically there's a circle inside which creates an in-center at the center of the circle and uh, it's inscribed, the circle is inscribed within the triangle. So let's find the indicated measure. Um, in this case, uh, this piece right here these are the perpendicular pieces, they are the radii of the inscribed circle. So if I'm trying to find BG, 
BG is going to be the same length as GF, so it's going to be 16. Over here, point, D, uh, point P is the in center of this triangle. So what happens is I have uh, what looks to me like a right triangle, where 25 is my hypotenuse. If I was to go through and actually solve um, for the length P, I'm sorry, the length from P to N, I could do that uh, making use of the Pythagorean theorem. So what I might do here is I might, you know, just concentrate on this one triangle. Uh, remember the Pythagorean theorem basically says that a leg squared plus the leg squared has to equal the hypotenuse squared. Um, I don't usually use that ABC thing. I think it's not really that descriptive. So we have leg squared plus 24 squared equals 25 squared. Um, the leg squared would then equal 25 squared minus 24 squared. Um, that would give me that the leg squared would equal, let's see, that's 625, that's 576. The leg squared would then, if I subtract that, equal 49. If I take the square root of both sides, that tells me that my leg has to equal plus or minus 7. In this case, this leg, this length PN right here, um, it has to be a positive number because we're talking about a length. So even though the square root produces two separate answers here, Whenever I take the square root, I have a plus or minus. Um, I only take the plus as my, my definitive answer because this is actually represents some sort of length. So the answer is just 7. Find JP would also be 7. Uh, we have a very similar concept going on here except I use variables. So what we do is we have to define basically what our right triangle is. Uh, this looks like my right triangle here. Um, if I can put this here, 4x is my leg, um, 52 turns out to be my hypotenuse, and if I can kind of transfer this part over here, um, I could say 48 is this length here, or actually this really isn't a great representation because these are probably going to be slightly different lengths. Really, if I concentrate, I'm going to just redraw this triangle because this is turning out to be a mess. Um, we can look at this, um, that 52 is our hypotenuse, 48 is going to be sort of our long leg, and 4x is actually this same distance here, sort of the radius, so I'll put a 4x right here. What's different about this process is if I take my leg squared, like so, um, plus the other leg squared, that's 48 squared, it has to equal the hypotenuse squared, which looks like this. So this leg, when I square this, gives me 16x squared. Um, 48 is a pretty big number. Um, Let me see if I have this written down somewhere. 48 squared. No, I have no idea what 48 squared is. If I only had a calculator, it would be really helpful. 48 squared, somewhere maybe 20, 2304? Well, I hope that's right. I'm sure somebody will let me know if it's not correct. Um, this is 2704. Well, that'd be really cool if that was right. Uh, 2404, uh, 2304, and 2704. I then have 16x squared, and I'll subtract these from both sides and just be at 400, which is really nice. Uh, divide both sides by 16, and that gives me 25. Uh, again, the square root of, of 25 would produce plus and minus 5, but for us, this would only be... Um, 5 is what we're looking for. We're only looking for positive 5 because this has to be a positive number. Um, in other words, it has to be um, it has to be 5. Um, as we move on, if we look at this next problem, uh, again, we're dealing with pretty large numbers. Uh, if we concentrate on one of these triangles, let me just concentrate on this triangle here. Uh, 3x is going to be this leg. 45 is going to be this short, this other leg here, and 51 will be my hypotenuse. Um, I could probably draw that kind of right here. This is the triangle I'm concentrating on. The problem is like 51 just by itself, you're trying to figure out, is that this part, is it this part? This looks like it's this part. Well, then what's this leg over here? It's really the 3x because these three lengths all have to be the same. I'll use the exact same process. I'll say 51 squared equals 45 squared plus in parentheses 3x squared. The reason this is in parentheses is because I'll have to square it to get 9x squared. Um, and these just turn out to be pretty big numbers. If you go through the math, I don't want to waste your time with this, you just get x equal 8 
Um, it would again be plus or minus eight, but again, we're only gonna really take the positive number here. Okay, so the same process, if you wanna work through it on your own, um, work through it, they're just big numbers. Again, you'll divide by the nine. Next is find the value of x that makes n the in center of the triangle. Very similar work here. Um, we'll have to define some sort of right triangle. In this case, I'm gonna pick this right triangle right here. Um, I know the hypotenuse of the right triangle is gonna be 25. Let me just draw this a little bit bigger, something like this. Oh boy. This is 25. This is my right angle. This is 15. And this uh, part right here is gonna be my 5x. Um, again, I can go through here just using the Pythagorean theorem. Um, this would be 15 squared plus 5x squared. This would be in parentheses. I'd get some pretty big numbers again. That's 625 equals 225 plus 25x squared. Uh, when I subtract 225 from both sides, I'd have 400 equals 25x squared. Uh, when I divide by 25, that's 16 equals x squared or x would equal just a positive 4, not the positive and negative 4, but just positive 4 in this case. Um, making this length actually 20, so if I need to find the actual length, the length would be 20. There's another way to do this using, um, realizing that this is a Pythagorean triple. Pythagorean triples means that there's really common lengths of triangles. This is technically a, called a 3, 4, 5 triangle. We'll talk about this more with the Pythagorean theorem. But 3, 4, and 5 are really common ratios. Uh, notice this is multiplied by 5 in order to get the 15. This is multiplied by 5 to get 25. And uh, this 4 times 5 would give us the 20, which I said was the actual length here. There's a lot of uh, special right triangles that use these Pythagorean triples. It's sort of just a shortcut uh, of ratios of triangles. 3, 4, 5 is probably the most famous and most used Pythagorean triple. Um, in this problem, very similar again, just really drawn really poorly here. It's, it's more or less a problem of trying to figure out what, what they're actually trying to tell you. This side length is 10. It looks like the hypotenuse is 26. And this other side length is 2x. You go through exactly the same process um, of solving this problem. I don't want to just go through it again um, because I think you guys can handle it. If you want to know the answer for it, um, you could figure it out yourself. Um, I'd love to tell you, but... I've somehow misplaced my notes. No idea what it is. Next it says error analysis. Explain why the conclusion is not the correct given conclusion. So here's the idea. Um, it says that RV is going to equal PV. So that's saying that RV here is equaling PV. Well, generally speaking, if these were the perpendicular segments, that, that's correct. Are these perpendicular? I don't think they are, okay? So what they've done is they've actually taken these angle bisectors and just use this entire length to say, well, this length right here is gonna be my radius. And this length right here is just the extension of the angle bisector. Those turn out to be my radii. Well, those aren't right. So from these, you then have to figure out where the actual perpendicular length is. It might look something like this perpendicular. It might look something like this perpendicular. And that's a, that's a whole other thing that we need to talk about, is how to find the distance from a point to a line and how to find the perpendicular length. Um, sounds like it could be a project all in itself um, or some problems all by themselves. So this is not correct because you're using the part of the line segment that's actually um, the angle bisector as opposed to the perpendicular distance. Um, in hockey, Hockey, this is really similar to the soccer example I gave. It says, you and your friend are playing hockey in your driveway. You are the goalie, and your friend is going to shoot the puck from point S. So your friend, maybe his name is Steve, is going to shoot this puck. The goal extends from the left goalpost, oh, L, that makes sense, to the right goalpost, R, oh, that makes sense too. Where should you position yourself if you're the goalie, or your name is Gus, um, or you're a girl, or you're a guy? Uh, where should you position yourself to have the best chance to prevent your friend from scoring the goal? Well, mathematically, uh, you're going to be right in the middle. This is you, equidistant from both the left and the right goal post. If it was me, I would probably charge Steve. Um, Steve is someone who gets psyched out a lot. Psyched actually starts with a P, but he gets psyched out a lot. If you were to charge him, you'd probably mess up and slip on the ice and fall down. Uh, you'd get the puck, you'd hit it to this guy over here. He'd come in, slap shot it in, and it'd be a goal. 
and you guys would win the championship. It'd be awesome. You'd have a little cup and a trophy, and then you could spend the rest of your day just reading if you give a moose a muffin. It'd be great news. Um, your turn to complete for class. Here's uh, four problems. A little bit more complicated, a little bit more edgy, um, a little bit tougher, some things to really try to challenge you, but I know that each one of you guys can handle this. There'll be a little bit of factoring, a little bit of foiling, a little bit of uh, thinking hard, but what I want you to do is find the value of x. Um, you do know that um, we'll be using a right triangle. You'll specialize, uh, use this right triangle here. Uh, oh, that's a really bad drawing of that right triangle. 13 is the hypotenuse, x plus 6 is this leg, x minus 1 will represent this leg right here, um, and you'll end up finding the value for x. Again, if there's two values for x, make sure to go in and check to see if they work in these situations. x plus 6 does have to be a positive number, x minus 1 also has to be a positive number. Make sure to check that one out. Um, this one, a little bit more complicated. This is your uh, also kind of complicated, I guess. This is your right triangle. x plus 5 is going to be the, the length right here from j to g. You'll have two questions. Uh, really, the, the explanation of yes or no is, is really the best thing for you. Uh, make sure that you're able to explain why the in-center is always inside the triangle, not on a vertex, not on a side. To, uh, try to figure out and give the best reason you can. We'll talk about these in class. And lastly, holy smokes, check this thing out. Use the following information to find the coordinates of the in-center N of the triangle. So there's actually a formula, it's right here, uh, for finding your in-center, uh, it's the algebraic approach. And this is usually why we, we try finding in-centers using constructions or the computer or, or something else because this approach is actually fairly difficult and fairly involved. So what I want you to do is I want you to try this. Um, I did actually do this problem, it wasn't, it wasn't that tough. Um, it just took a little bit while to, to kind of put things in. I'll, I'll tell you what the answer is. The answer is technically five halves, five halves. I'll give you the answer, but you're gonna have to provide the work and mm, I don't know, you might need a little bit more room than this. Uh, for your homework, I do want you to copy these, uh, probably just this drawing, maybe the formula into your, into your uh, notebook. I think it'd be a good idea to kind of maybe write down what you see these points A, B, and C are. Um, maybe write down what A, the distance from B to C is, and C to A, and, and A to B as well. So that's kind of what I want you to do. Um, problems one through four, and then also this last problem, kind of an extra challenge problem. Um, remember, we're working with angle bisectors, and hopefully by now, you're able to use angle bisectors to find the distance relationships within triangles and elsewhere. Hope you had a good time. Um, and remember that if you're not part of the solution, you're actually part of the problem. Get out there and realize that math is life.